All right. Um, welcome everyone to the DDPS seminar. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's Today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, therefore no classified discussion is allowed, so please watch out. Finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. All right, um, it is an honor to host Ming Zhang, who is currently an assistant research scientist in the Texas A&M Institute of Data Science at the Texas A&M University. He works closely with Ulysses um, Braga, uh, Neto, Simon uh, Foucault, and many others on the algorithmic and theoretic uh, development of scientific machine learning. Before his positions at um, you know, Institute of Data Science in Texas A&M, he uh, worked as a postdoc postdoctoral researcher at the Johns Hopkins University with Mauro Megioni on data-driven modeling of self-organization from observation. He obtained his PhD in applied mathematics under the guidance of Aitan Ted Moore at the University of Maryland. Today, Ming will give a talk about machine learning of self-organizations uh, from observations. Uh, please expect a wonderful talk and and um, please enjoy it. And now without further ado, let me pass the button to Ming by asking our usual question. That is, what is your favorite things to do other than research Ming? Uh, coding in Python. <laughs> well, that's part of research still. Uh, on, uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, oh, right now I'm trying to uh, lose some weight. So uh, yeah, going to gym, yes. <laughs> Going to gym, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds healthy. Okay, yeah. well, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Choi, for the introduction. It is my uh, pleasure and also honor today to be able to share with you my uh, uh, years of research at Johns Hopkins, which is about how to combine machine learning and a dynamical system together so that we can do this data-driven modeling of self-organization. Uh, oh, sorry, that's the button. So here's an outline of my talk. Uh, I'm gonna uh, give you a brief motivation on how uh, we are gonna, or uh, why we're gonna combine machine learning and dynamical system together. And then after that, I'll give you a detailed framework on how to learn uh, self-organization from data. And then after that, I'll go through a uh, several uh, simple extensions on how to extend our learning framework to various different dynamical systems. And then uh, the fourth session, we'll talk about how to actually apply our learning framework to actual data, to, to, to um, real data and how to overcome this difficulty of learning from real data. And then at the end, I will talk about uh, two ongoing projects. We are actually making pretty good progress with it and some future directions we are taking with this approach. So um, here is uh, the motivation. Uh, we want to, so uh, we all know that machine learning is really good at recognizing patterns. And there are actually a lot of interesting patterns that arise naturally in the world. For example, these static strike patterns on zebra um, patterns doesn't need to be static all the time. Even this is relatively static in uh, relative spacing, this V formulation from this flocking of birds. Or even this, you have a static shape, but all the position are already non static, this spherical shape forming from this milling of fish. And these pattern doesn't need to be uh, static in space, it can be static in other abstract space. Say, for example, this frequency space, you have this synchronization of clocks. Okay. All of the different interesting patterns, we want to understand that, and most importantly, we want to be able to predict or even reproduce these patterns. So we need to understand uh, what caused these patterns, and all of this can be put under the banner of so-called self-organization. So where a global order would emerge from initially chaotic state via only local interactions. So you only need local interactions, and you have some kind of global order. And it happens a lot. You have it in crystal growth, superconductivity. You've seen this in chemistry for this monocular self-assembly. You already seen some of these flocking of birds and other social behavior in insects. And in uh, human society, you have this market uh, like, uh, economy behavior and traffic flow. You can see that all over the place. Okay? If you understand this, you can apply 
abstractly to uh, unsupervised uh, learning using this so-called particle swarm optimization. You can even uh, use that to analyze consensus, how opinion is formed, how social behavior of humans is actually uh, formed and behave. Yeah, once you know how inter uh, animals interact with each other, you can uh, study the migration of animals and uh, do conservations of animals. And if once you know how true humans, particles, uh, animals are interact, you can build that into robot and do digital trains using these uh, bionic interactions. So we want to understand that. And most importantly, we want to understand it from the mathematical point of view. We want to build some kind of math mechanism to actually explain it. Okay? Uh, and there's a, a basic, really simple dynamical system mechanism behind it. You use an inter interacting agent system to actually build this self-organization. Uh, you just allow these uh, pairwise interaction between agents. You can have agents of different types. You can have agents interacting with the environment, but as long as you allow only pairwise interactions, you should be able to reproduce this global behavior. But the most important question is how to actually model the so-called interactions between the agents. Okay? There are many different ways. Take this uh, flocking model, for example. If you want to in, uh, model the interaction between the birds, you will allow this so-called three zoom principle. So when the agents get close, they should repulse. When the agents get really far away, they should attract. And in the middle of the interaction range, they should align their headings. So this three zones alignment you can actually use to model flockings. There are the uh, dynamical system that follow different principles. So for Potosi, they have this self-propelling particle systems. Uh, for Krauss, they have the opinion for consensus formulation of the particle system. Okay? But what we want to do is, can we actually derive for observation data? Say, for example, I look at how the birds are actually interacting, flying up in the sky, can actually derive the system to actually, uh, uh, to actually give the uh, interaction rules between all the ages. That's what we want to do. We want to divide, develop this system to actually validate and improve the self-organization dynamics. So that's our motivations. We want to use machine learning to guide us in order to give us the uh, organized dynamical system. And the learning framework, the next step is about the learning framework. So the question go back to, can I actually learn the influences from the observational data? Okay? And most importantly, can I actually derive the dynamic system which gives some, some kind of physical meaning? Okay? And can I actually apply our learning method to as many different dynamic systems as possible? And can my learning handle big data? So it has to be efficient and effective. Okay. In order to do that, let me start off with a really, really simple dynamical system. Let's consider a system of just n agents, and each agent is assigned a state. And this state vector can be used to describe emotion, position, velocity, phases, etc., etc., anything that you want. So I want this state, the change of this state vector, that is trying to minimize a certain system energy. Okay. And this system energy has a really special form. It's just a sum of all the potential depending on pairwise distance between all the agents. Okay? And simplifying, I have that the change of the state for each agent is an average sum of a interaction function that is based on pairwise interaction between all the agents and also weighted by the pairwise difference. Okay? And we will call this interaction function the interaction kernel. Okay, so uh, the current research would be starting from a known class or regularity uh, requirement for these fees, I can induce desired emergent behavior. So if phi is all positive, we have the cluster, uh, clustering. Uh, if it's uh, satisfy some talent requirement, we have the flocking and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, what we want to do is when we take only the observation of the state and change of the state, over a certain period of time for the whole system, can we actually derive the so-called interaction kernel from observation data using the inverse problem approach? Okay, so we want to do that. Okay, before I tell you the variation approach, let's just assume that my unknown function live in a really nice space so that the dynamic system has a unique and uh, uh, unique solutions. And uh, if I and I also want to compare this to the regression approach. If I put everything into this one big vector, the state vector and also the right hand side vector, actually I'm looking at 
finding a right-hand side function that can map the state vector to its derivative. So it looks really, really similar to regression. However, the state vector, the observation vector, they're, no, they're not independent. So we don't have data independence, so we cannot use the regression approach. Even if you can derive some, form, some kind of independence, they are living in a high dimensional space. So you still will be cursed by the dimensional lab. So we want to uh, tackle these two approaches in actually an analyzing the convergence. So we will uh, take this uh, continuous data and then discretize it. So, and also we'll consider this trajectory data coming out of different initial conditions. So now we have a discretized data from various different initial conditions. And then we will build um, a, a air functional that trying to minimize the derivative of the observed state to the predicted state on the test function. Okay, so if I can have that, then I should be have something convergent to my annoying interaction kernel. Okay, and because my search space is nice, it's compact and convex, uh, compact in terms of the L infinity norm, then this minimizer would exist. Okay, but to show the convergence is rather difficult. So let's consider a uh, expected version of my error functional, that the m going to infinity. And then it's really uh, easy to show that the minimizer of the discretized uh, error functional would go to this expected version of error functional. Okay, the only question would remain is that can I show that L phi hat L infinity h is indeed my unknown interaction kernel? If I can show that, then I can use law of large number to show this convergence and hence converging to this interaction kernel. Okay. Well, in order to show for me to show this, I need an additional uh, condition on my uh, inverse problem, a so-called causality condition, which basically just bound the error functional that I'm trying to minimize by the distance between the unknown true interaction question, uh, function to the test function. Okay, using this uh, particular L2 rho t norm. This rho t actually tells me the uh, distribution of pair distance. Okay, and with that, we're able to show that the convergence, if I can construct this various sequence of phi hat L minimizer for an incre ever increasing search space, then we'll have the convergence of this phi hat to the unknown interaction at the rate of m to the negative one third, which is very similar to a 1D regression rate. Okay. And I can also have the predicted dynamical system converging to the observed dynamical system, the trajectories, okay, with uh, roughly the same rate. Okay, so my learning rate is uh, depends only on m, the number of uh, initial conditions, and is optimal in terms of the 1D regression. But my learning rate, oh, well, sorry, my learning rate doesn't depend on the dimension of the observation data. That's one thing. So if, even if I have the number of agents going to infinity or the state getting really large, my rate will not deteriorate. However, my uh, learning rate, will, depending on the number of time I make uh, observation, is still is still open problem. We're still working on that, okay? So now we have a theoretical guarantee on the convergence of getting the unknown interactions. Now we want to talk about if I can implement this in an effective algorithm so that I can deal with a large data set. Okay, so we start off for this from this discrete uh, observation data. Okay, we'll compute this so-called learning interval with this minimum and maximum interaction radius between all my agents. Once I build this learning interval, I can build up on it a space of uh, basis function, which is my search space using either clamp based blind or piecewise uh, polynomials, anything that you want. Okay. And then after that, we'll take the optimal basis uh, dimension of my search space at, uh, with the formula that we calculated from our theory. It's just roughly about m to the one third using uniform partition. We can also use adaptive partition, but uniform partition would be one of the uh, most easier one to use. And then I will express my, uh, express my uh, search uh, test function as a linear combination of this basis function over this search space and plug in to my minimize, minimization problem and that I get a linear systems. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll answer the question in the chat later. And then once I have that, once I, my theoretical, uh, my convergence theorem guarantees that the linear system that I attain actually is really nice. The condition number on this linear system is actually well controlled. 
So I can actually solve it to get all the linear the coefficients for my basis. I can reconstruct my estimator, and then you can use it to predict my uh, dynamical system and do long time be, uh, behavior analysis on my dynamical systems. Okay, and in this case, I mentioned that I need the state observation of the state and the derivative of the state. But in fact, we don't need that. As long as I have a really good approximation of this derivative, we can still plug it in and, and obtain a really good estimator out of this linear system. We have a guarantee on that using RKHS. Okay. Uh, so uh, about computational compactity. So uh, this algorithm can handle really big data. So in order to for me to talk about, let me just uh, uh, refresh your memory about all of these different parameters, this ML and D here. Okay, for computing time, the total computing time is actually roughly m to the uh, five uh, three fifths. Okay, so it's a little bit super linear in terms of the number of uh, initial conditions. But if you use parallel uh, algorithm to actually uh, reconstruct the linear system based on each uh, different initial conditions, you can cut it down into roughly linear in terms of m. The storage actually, you just need to store one initial condition at, uh, I mean, one system trajectory at a time. And then construct that, save it somewhere, and then do another one. So it's still highly parallelizable. And then at the end, it's just roughly n squared. And this is just m to the two thirds. So everything you can use in parallelization, you can cut it into linear. And we have a software package that you can try and use to reproduce all the results that we have from these papers and also these different uh, dynamical systems. Okay. Also, uh, just to answer the, the question in the chat, by dimension of data is, is actually not just the number of agents, it's the number of agents times the uh, length of each state vector, so it's n times d. So the dimension of data is, is, uh, is capital D, way bigger than just the number of agents. Okay, so now uh, go back into this. So now we can apply this to the so-called opinion dynamics, which is used to govern how a consensus is formed. Uh, so this blue line is actually the opinion sets of each agents uh, on the left, are the true dynamics using uh, generated from different initial conditions. On the right are the estimated dynamics. That's the one we learn from the data and then use the estimator to regenerate the dynamics. This blue dashed line here, I mean, no, a black dashed line here in the middle of it is the indicate the learning time. So from zero to 10, that's the chaining time. We take this portion to chain and then we learn and then predict, okay? So as you can see, we can, at least up to the learning time, we have pretty close assembling with the true dynamics and even prediction of the number at large time, the prediction of the number of clusters, we actually have a high agreement with that, okay? And for this row, this is generated for a totally different initial conditions. Not only we can get really high accuracy with producing the dynamical, uh, dynamics, we also have, can predict the large time behavior of these dynamics. So this is the true dynamic versus the estimate dynamics, okay? Uh, well, uh, to answer the question in the chat, yes, uh, uh, for, for the time in the dynamics, the final time in the dynamics, we, uh, it's, it's not really uh, actually independent variables, but rather it's like a, 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 a uh, we want to have uh, the amount of, we want to have first is a really short period of time. Okay, so let's say which can only uh, observe the dynamical system for a really short period of time. And also we want the dynamical system to be as mixing as possible. That means that the pairwise data is as uh, many, at many different points as possible. Okay, so here's an example is, uh, is yes and no to the, to the uh, questions in the chat room in the chat window, okay? So here's a comparison between the true interaction kernel to the uh, learned interaction kernel. The black one is the true interaction kernel. The blue one is the learned interaction kernel. We do not assume that the kernel is compactly supported. We also do not assume the this point of this continue, uh, knowledge of the point of discontinuity. We learn all of this from data and we can actually approximate this point of discontinuity really well, okay? where we can also learn this uh, compact support from the uh, true, uh, from just the data about this true interaction kernel. And in the background, this is the comparison of the uh, distribution of the parallel distance. Okay, so we can see we actually learn over that. Okay, so now we know that we have a learning theory that we will have the 
uh, phi hat, the estimate of our interaction kernel convergence to the phi at about 1D regression rate. And we guarantee that the linear system generated, uh, 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 yes, for that we have a real data uh, example for that, yes. And then we have guarantee of that uh, linear system being uh, well conditions. Now the next question is, can we actually extend these to various different dynamic systems? The first one is about, can I actually handle a uh, system of heterogeneous agents, where agents of different types. So for example, this dynamical system, I have a single predator chasing a group of prey, and we are able to learn that dynamical system uh, uh, for four different kinds of interaction kernels, and we can predict the behavior of the predator pretty well. Also, uh, the group of prey is also good, okay? So again, on the left are the two dynamics, on the right are the learned dynamics, and if they're on the same row, they share the same initial conditions. So here's the behavior of this uh, two types of agents dynamical system, a single predator chasing a group of preys. And because of that, we'll learn a total of four different interaction kernels. Uh, this one is the prey on prey interaction kernel. This is the predator on prey. This is the prey on predator. And this is the predator on predator interaction kernel because we only have one single interaction uh, uh, predator. So the predator on predator kernel have no data. We cannot learn it from the data. So it's actually learned as zero, okay? And I want to point out the uh, predator on prey interaction kernel and the prey on predator interaction kernel. These two kernels share the same interaction uh, data. It's the same pair of distant data, but we're able to learn it. As you can see the distribution uh, roughly the same. Okay, we're able to learn it totally different behavior, not negative of each other. It's a totally different behavior of this two kernel, okay? so. We can actually do that from this predator to praise dynamical system. Uh, we can also extend this system to a second order system. So we only talk about a first order system. We can also do second order. We can also study the large time behavior of our estimated dynamical system. Okay. As it turns out, we have conducted several studies on this. As it turns out, it actually preserved the qualitative behavior. So for example, this is the fish milling dynamical system that I talked about. So the fish will swing in this vertical shape. In, in fact, this is a double milling example. So half of them will swing clockwise, the other half will swing counterclockwise. So let me show the movie. Oh, back. So, oh, stop. So initially they are at uh, chaotic states. And if I let the run time run, eventually half of them will swing clockwise, the other half will swing counterclockwise. And the exact same thing happens for this uh, <clears throat> learn dynamics too. Although not exactly at the same num uh, uh, number of agents, oh no, 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 at the same agents, but the same number of agents will do the same thing, okay? So we actually have a check to, to check this large time behavior, okay? So we have that. And the next is about these flocking dynamics. This one is a little bit, um, a little bit, a little bit more difficult, uh, uh, no, no more difficult more complicated than the original cocker smell flocking dynamics. The cocker smell flocking dynamics, the birds will anticipate, uh, not anticipate, will have the position, the current position of the neighboring birds. And they will flock, which means that they will fly in the same velocity at the large time. Okay? In this case, these birds will anticipate the neighboring birds at the future position. So they do not do it at current time, at future time. And if they do that, they will not fly at the same direction right away. Rather than they will fly around a central max, a central mass velocity directions and kind of circle around there for a large time and then eventually fly at the same velocity. So let me show you a movie about this anticipated flocking dynamics. So you can see uh, all of for these uh, for these learned dynamics, we can actually and not only the exact positions, but also the large time behavior of these flocking of birds. So that's that. Okay. So these are the second order dynamical systems that we can learn. Now the next uh, natural questions would uh, would be if I have the agents constrained on a spherical ball or other kind of renomian manifolds, can I still learn these uh, dynamical system or the interaction kernel from this data? Okay. As it turns out, yes. So originally, I have that the parallel distance depend only on Euclidean distance, okay? Because I'm in a Euclidean space. If I'm on a manifold, I need to change that to geodesic distance. That's what we want to do. And simplify it, I have that the change of my state 
if the states are constrained on Riemannian manifold, it's still an average sum of the pairwise geodesic distance based on these states on Riemannian manifold. I have I have to know that my Riemannian manifold and its uh, uh, metric in order to compute the geodesic distance. Okay, and my interaction kernel is just the pairwise uh, derivative of the pairwise potential, and this directions. Uh, I put a restriction on that in order to have a existing a unique mix of my dynamical system. Okay, basically it's just flow into the geodesic uh, tangential directions. If the points is in the is not in the uh, uh, Carlotta set, if it's in the Carlotta set, we have to set it to zero in order to preserve continuity. Okay, so in order to learn from this dynamical system constrained on Riemannian manifolds, we need to have respect the geometry. So we design the norm, the air functional, using the uh, using the Riemannian matrix that is given to me. So basically, doing that, I can actually obtain the same learning rate as if they are actually living in Euclidean space. I can also show the convergence of the estimated dynamics to the true dynamics within the learning time interval, as the number of initial conditions going to infinity. Okay. So now I, I show you this group of agents constrained on a two D sphere. In this case, still a single predator chasing a group of prey, so they would chase them into the north or the south pole. Okay, again, on the left are the true dynamics, on the right are the uh, learned dynamics. If they're on the same row, they share the same initial conditions. Uh, another thing is the reason why we want to assume the learning of this particular form is that if we learn the interaction kernel, it's really easy for us to do transfer learning. When I say transfer learning is, if I learn from this agents of uh, this system of 20 agents, I will be able to transfer this learning result to a system of 40 agents or even 80 agents right away because I learned the interaction kernel, which is independent of the number of agents in the system and also independent of the initial conditions. Okay, so I can do that. So the third row shows you the transfer learning results from our learning framework. We can handle this rather easy and um, also, we can maintain a pretty good relative accuracy in predicting the trajectories. Okay, so because we have a total of two types of agents, we have a total of four different interaction kernels to learn. And in this case, we can actually learn this really well. Okay, and this is a, a, a predator chasing group of three constrained to a point crea disk example. So they are actually following the point crea metric. Okay, mm, hyperbolic metric, sorry. Okay. Again, we can do the transfer learning and we can preserve this uh, uh, behavior, the, especially the predator behavior, really well. Okay. In fact, uh, for the concrete uh, disk, we actually learn it better than those agents constrained on uh, a uh, to this field. Okay. So this is the example. Okay. So the next one, so we, we learn all of this on similar data. The next question, the general question is, can we handle actual real data applications? So we try it on the selection mechanics. So, uh, so our goal is not to, we well, we are to discover what Newton did, but our, our goal is we want to let the computer do this. We want to let the computer reading the input data and spit out the Newton's law of gravity, okay? Without telling it that the, the trajectory is elliptical, the trajectory are closed, the laws satisfy certain of form. No, just tell them it is a pairwise interactions agent based model. Tell me the kernel, the potential, the gravity potential that actually explains this data. Okay. Uh, uh, let me answer the quick, quick, quick the questions in the chat real quick. So uh, for the manifold, we we. We, we do not, well, yeah, we, we kind of know that the manifold and the metric in some sense. So we do assume we know the, we have uh, adequate knowledge of the manifold. Uh, and we haven't tried to, to use my search space depending on the manifold yet. Um, uh, so we, we are looking into that. So for now, we actually have, have adequate amount of knowledge of the manifold and we don't, we assume we know everything, we can parameterize it, and, and it's just that the, um, the norm depends on the manifold in some sense, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, and also that will take more time. Let me go. I mean, I mean, I mean yeah. when you answer, answer the questions to the, to the, the 
uh, the chat in, in the chat. Uh, if you can read the question first and then answer, that would be oh, okay. very helpful because not, not everyone has the access to the chat link. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me towards the end and answer all of this together. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, for this, uh, uh, selection mechanics examples. So we want to learn that the interactions between the sun and all the major planets in the solar system, we're going to ignore the uh, extra belts, the two extra belts. And then, uh, we're going to just do the interaction between the sun and a major planet, and also the moon of the earth, because this moon earth sun's three by the system has been well studied. So we want to we want to know that. Okay. And um, yes, okay. So uh, in order to, for us to actually explain this, we want to uh, extend our first order dynamical system, the framework to second order. So we're going to assume this so-called Lagrangian is the sum of the uh, kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And again, we're going to assume that the potential energy is the sum of the pairwise potential. Okay, and it has uh, different form. So here I'm, I'm going to assume that my state actually has the position and the velocity. Okay, so the power potential is going to be different between each agents. So it's going to be uh, uh, has the mass information and some other information enclosed in this in this uh, uh, into a, a potential kernel. Okay, so using the Lagrangian equation relationship, I have that the basically just uh, the second uh, Newton's second law comes out the total. Uh, uh, momentum is just the total uh, uh, gravitational forces times by the, the times the directions, okay. And then I have I have basically put that put it back into first order dynamical system form that the change of my velocity is the average sum. But in this case, because each pair of agents are different, so I don't have the one over n there. Depending on the pairwise distance weighted by the pairwise. Uh, uh, displacement in these agents. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to assume that my power this uh, power interaction uh, kernels has the mass information enclosed in there. Okay, it's not gonna. Uh, well, I'm not gonna assume that we know this. I'm gonna just assume that the pairwise interaction kernel between each agent is different. Okay, so in order, I'm gonna learn a total n square interaction kernels altogether. Okay. So yeah, so first I'm going to test it on simulated data. I'm going to test it on a celestial mechanics with Newton's gravity. Okay, and we know that the Newton's gravity is just the uh, Newton's second law that the general uh, universal gravity follows this form. Okay, I'm going to assume that I have absolute space time because right now we cannot deal with second order Riemannian manifold yet, and I'm going to assume the initial mass is the same thing as gravitational mass so that I can cancel out these two masses. And I'm going to also assume because we're using absolute space time that gravity will have in immediate actions at every single planet right away. Okay, so I, now I can simplify it. I can simplify the initial mass and gravitational mass on both sides and also put this, this term here over so that I have the GMI prime over RQ form instead of the original R square form. Okay, and then I'm going to assume that these interaction kernels are all different. And they only depend on power distance. So, and I'm not going to given the mass of each planet and also not the sun. I'm not going to assume that a particular geometry of my uh, uh, trajectories. I'm going to assume only point wise observation of my trajectories. And I'm only going to assume my power distance is different for each planet, planet, or planet sun interactions, but it depends on power distance data. So, that's the only knowledge I have. But I need to look, look, uh, learn a total of n square interaction kernels from a system uh, uh, from one observation of the system. Okay, so here's the result of learning uh, over the inner solar system. I have the sun, and uh, five other planets. Okay, but this is simulated, so I can I'm allowed to generate it with different initial conditions. For the actual solar system, I cannot. Okay, so I have that. Uh, and, and as you can see, the left are the true dynamics, the right are the learned dynamics. The two offer a really close resemblance with each other, even with the coloring. Okay. And in fact, I can learn a total of 25 uh, interaction kernels at the same time over uh, the same observation of the whole system. And this is the uh, planet on sun interactions. This is the sun on planet interactions. I can learn the planet on sun and sun on planet interaction really well. 
some of these interplanet interactions, like for example, this Mars on Mercury, and this is the Mars on uh, Mercury on Mars interaction kernel. I cannot learn them that well because they are well below the numerical uh, accuracy for a single position data. And also this Earth on Mercury is not that good, but some of the others, I can learn them well, as long as they are above 10 to the negative 10 uh, uh, scale, okay? But that's just, that's just uh, the numerical errors that, that is uh, 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 inherent in the data. But if you look at just the first row and also first column, I have the planet on sun interaction kernel and sun on planet interaction kernel. Then if you look at these, especially say, for example, the mercury on sun interaction kernel and sun on mercury, the two behave roughly the same, except maybe at different time uh, uh, length scale. Okay, so this is 10 to negative nine, this is 10 to negative two, but they, they, they decay roughly the same way. Okay, so that points out that maybe there's a hidden information behind these estimators of these uh, kernels that we can actually decouple from it. So we decouple the information of the Newton's form, remember it's uh, one of our Q because we switch a little bit, okay, from these estimated kernels and it fits really well to the described Newton's form, and we're able to extend that to a continuous function, even at, at a really, really large disjoint domain, okay? And out of that, we decouple the one of our Q form from the interaction kernel, as well as the masses from the interaction kernel. So we can learn the individual sun and individual planets masses from our uh, learned estimator, and we can maintain a, at least a two-digit accuracy at estimating them, okay? So we have that, okay? So now we learn pretty good for uh, similar data. So, so the next thing would be, can I actually do it for uh, 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 real data? So we take it to this uh, NASA's um, data that we actually take it off the Horizon uh, website, okay? And it's been developing uh, by now. It's been developed by NASA uh, over, since 1980s, and it's really accurate. And um, and well, it is considered synthetic data, but it's actually really close to the true observation data. So we take it as the true observation data. Okay. So we will take the sun, as I said before, eight major planets, and the moon of the Earth, because we want to study the three-body problem. We will take 500s years of daily, only daily position and velocity data from 1500 to 1999. And we'll use that to learn the estimator and then use the estimator to estimate the trajectories or we produce the trajectories. And in order to, to keep the system uh, stable, we will use a symplectic integration in order to in be able to integrate over 500 years of data. Okay, and once we obtain the trajectories, we use it to estimate its geometry, the geometric property of this to study the period, the perihelion uh, and aphelion. And once we know that we can actually preserve these geometric properties, we study the really highly sensitive perihelion precession rate of our trajectory data, okay? And then we also will compare our results to Newton's simulation and also to the einstein infeld hoffman systems. This in, uh, einstein infeld hoffman system is a first order approximation of the general relativity system, uh, theory, okay? So here's the result, the comparison between uh, the Earth, Moon, Sun system of the GPL is the observation data we take from the uh, GPL database. LD is the one that we learned from the GPL data and also we produce it using symplectic integration. EIH is the uh, uh, similar data from the einstein infer hoffman system also using uh, uh, so, no, this is the fully implicit uh, uh, integrator using Mendel's integrator, and then Newton's is using a symplectic integrator. As you can see, this four system, if you look at it using eyeball norm, they offer no major differences. Okay, so we can actually preserve this property over a large time, okay, using our integrator. And then this is the inner solar system, okay, so this is the one taken from the true observation data, okay, as you can see, our our uh, estimator behave roughly the same thing as Newton's. Uh, the IH has a way narrow band for, uh, this is, uh, I think this is Mars, okay? Then what we have, 
for uh, for this uh, for this trajectories. We are actually more similar to Newton's because we use the collective dynamics framework. Okay, and this is the outer solar system. Okay, and again we behave roughly the same thing as as Newton's. So now we have the eyeball norms of these trajectories. Now let's look at the quantitative analysis of these errors. So we take these uh, position and velocity data, and then we compute errors over 450 years and also another 500 years. Okay, and we do comparison of this. Uh, the blue ones, the, the light and dark blue ones, are the ones from our own learning dynamical system. The light and dark red ones are from the Einstein system. The light and dark yellow ones are from the Newton system. Okay. Uh, Again, I want to mention that we change from 450 years of data and predict another 50 years, okay, due to the uh, lim limited amount of data that we have. Okay? As you can see, if we do the prediction of the positions and velocity over 500 or even 450 years or 500 years, our accuracy actually beat, overall beat Einstein and Newton, okay, um, in terms of just position and velocity at each time. Uh, at the uh, time instance prediction. We can also study the geometric properties of the trajectories. We can estimate the period out of these trajectories. We're able to actually learn the period really well, except at the Neptunes. Uh, Neptunes okay? And with that, we can also study the aphelium and perihelium, which is the closest and furthest, further away uh, position of, uh, of your planet with the sun. Okay? We do it really bad with Mercury, but beside that, everything else, we do it really good. And for the perihelium, we also a little bit worse than the Newtons and Einsteins, okay? But we're doing really good for all the others, okay? And here is a comparison of the interaction kernels. Now this time to, to tell you that we are doing okay to the interaction kernel, we compare it to Newton's gravity. So the black line through the middle is the relative errors of Newton's gravity. So if we are close to the black line in the middle, we are close to Newton's, okay? The gray background is the range of the Einstein interactions. The Einstein interactions does not depend only on pairwise distance. It also depends on uh, speed, pairwise velocity, and also acceleration. So it has a projected range over that, okay? As you can see, uh, the Blue dash line is the one that we learn, is the relative errors that we learn. We can actually maintain this range in between uh, the Newtons and the Einstein range for each, for most of the planet on sun, uh, sun on planet interactions, because that's the major ones. That's the one govern the actual movement of the solar system. Okay. And this is the sun on planet interaction kernel. Again, in the gray background is the range of the Einstein interactions. The black one, the black solid one through zero is the actual Newtons, okay? Uh, as you can see, as once we get small to below 10 to negative 10, the numerical error kicks in. We have no hope of learning this uh, that accurate, okay? But we are able to learn the, decouple these planet on sun interaction kernel from the system, from learning from this system of data really well, okay? And because we, can reproduce the position, reproduce the velocity, the period, the helium, perihelium that well. We're also looking into the most sensitive perihelium precession rate. Okay, I want to mention that the the uh, the trajectories of Mars data, Mars data is actually used in the discovery of the Newton's universal law of gravitation. Okay, so Mars is like the the, the typical Newton's planet. The perihelium precession rate of Mercury. That's the one explained by Einstein's general relativity theory. So you need a relativity effect term in order to actually predict that. We do not have that, but we are able to actually predict pretty close to that using a general form of this power distance. Okay, uh, in Moon though, Moon because Moon is small, is really really highly sensitive to perturbation. You actually need a lunar theory, a lunar perturbation theory to explain the movement. Okay. But we are able to actually incorporate all of these perturbation inside our power distance kernel, and then actually to learn that and produce a really highly uh, accurate perihelion precession rate to do that. So um, you need three different theories to explain all these three. 
movement, uh, our learning dynamics, uh, uh, learning framework can do that in one uh, framework, in one uniform framework. Okay, so that computer can can explain this selection mechanics movement. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so yeah, again, uh, uh, for simulated data, we're able to decouple and find the knowledge of the mass, and 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 also the uh, the form of my pairwise distance interactions. Okay. For this, the actual data, we can also do that. So we go back and we change the uh, decoupling position and then still obtain at least a two digit relative accuracy in estimating the masses. We do not know the mass when we actually learn the dynamical system. Okay? And also decouple from it are really close to Newton, which explains why we actually behave mostly like a Newton because we actually uh, are getting a really like a Newton's kernel okay? due to the restriction of that kernel. Okay, so that's that. So we can actually handle real data if uh, uh, we actually uh, uh, take into consideration of all the uh, different dynamical uh, system and different uh, hidden parameters in it. We can actually use it to actually discover the extra physical quantities. So next thing is, I've been talking about that the parallel distance kernel, that the kernel depends on parallel distance. But in fact, you can have a general kernel that depends only on parallel state. But if you do that, this is a high dimensional function. It's really difficult to learn. So we use a reduced uh, feature map techniques to actually learn the feature map first and then learn the interaction kernel. And here's an example of comparing the, uh, uh, so uh, phi one is the one that we do not know the feature map. Phi two is the one that we do know the feature map. As you can see, we actually, uh, in terms of errors, that, uh, that our regression actually is better than learn, uh, knowing the feature map. Okay, so here's a comparison of the trajectories. Uh, um, we can just for learning and learning really well. And then this is a 2D example when this feature map is actually uh, a 2D function instead of a uh, 2, yeah. Okay, and we can also do this just for learning really well. So that's the first example that we do not know the feature map. We don't know if the interaction kernel depends on power distance. It might depend on something else. We can use a uh, dimension reduction technique to actually learn that. Okay, the next step is, what if I only had one snapshot of the dynamical system? Okay, so uh, before I have several snapshots. In fact, I have a large amount of snapshots. Okay, what if the dynamical system already reaches steady state and only take one time? Okay, if I do that, I need to use a, a, a some kind of inverse problem regularization from uh, RKHS to actually help me to find the kernel up to a scaling scaling factor that if I'm giving a steady state of this dynamical system, I can learn the interaction kernel up to a scaling factor really close to the original one. So if, if I only uh, give me one snapshot, I can still learn, but it's, it's up to a scaling factor. Okay? So that's the two uh, ongoing project. We finished the feature map learning already. So we're looking into this uh, uh, steady state learning. Okay, so that's that. So there are some other things. So we finished the first order learning on the feature map. So we're looking into the second order examples, especially when the second order have both the flocking and, uh, uh, and other milling behavior altogether. We're also looking into this uh, RKHS learning example, how to use the uh, kernel. We actually, all of this dynamical system actually has its own kernel and own reproducing kernel. How can we use that to actually do denoising? How can we actually use it to, to give us a better basis, a search space to find the solutions and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we're also looking into uh, how to learn on uh, dynamics constraint on Riemannian man second order dynamics constraint on Riemannian manifolds. Okay. And we always look at real data applications uh, because we want to know if our learning framework can be applied to real actual data. Okay. And uh, we're also looking into how to expand these, these models, these collected by, uh, behavior models. Uh, for example, how can I actually extend the model so that it will actually generate local swarming? Because local swarming is a little bit more, dif uh, more different than flocking, okay? And all this different stuff. And um, I've, been, I've been talking about that the, uh, the state change of the state vector is an average sum, but uh, birds cannot do calculation. It will not know average sum. So it should be a topological uh, averaging. It only knows those 
uh, roughly lo uh, locally neighboring to, uh, to the birds. So we look into topological averaging in sort of, you know, instead of uh, total averaging. And also uh, when, when the number of agents going to infinity, we want to understand the mean field limit and how to learn them well. Okay? We also look into some PD related problems that is derived from these uh, self organized dynamics, mean field games, et cetera, and all of this. Okay? Uh, so here's a uh, references. Okay, so this is the four approach we use uh, this one. That's the one for the fish muni example. We use this for flocking. This is the photo taxi example, uh, but we didn't show it. And then we have, this is the predator chasing a group of prey example that we use. And then we have the anticipation dynamics and also the opinion dynamics that we use. So this is the uh, papers that we use for generating all these dynamic data. And here is the, uh, uh, the references on the learning framework that we have been building up. So we start out from this first paper that Amaro did with this group of German people on, on how to uh, uh, learn the interaction kernel when the number of agents go to infinity. And then this is our first paper on extending that, but fix the number of agents rather than letting the number of agents go into infinity. We think about number of in, uh, different initial conditions going to infinity. And then we look at the large time behavior of our estimated dynamics and uh, all of this different stuff uh, they are available online. You can look, on, look them up and then, and yeah, that's it. Um, any, uh, uh, thank you, Ming. Thank you, Ming, for the great uh, presentations. Uh, yeah. uh, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the pad is going to be um, very active in Q&A session. So, do you, yeah, Pat, do you want to uh, engage directly? Um, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> hey, so I, yeah, I asked a lot of questions. You don't have to answer them all. We can take them offline. Uh, okay. But okay. Do, we, mean, do you have a way to record to record the questions, or do I, we need to cut and paste them? Um, record what do you mean? I mean, it's 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 being recorded right now. The text um, box. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll, text actually, box. I'll, I'll I'll grab them. So so, uh, but uh, but thank you. This was really. Yeah. I mean, I'm I find this fascinating work. This is great. Oh. Um, but the thing that I'm most confused about is what, exactly what you mean by an interaction kernel, and how, and and so and and how you use it. So so in machine learning, uh, at least as we defined it back in the 1980s. You can't talk about learning until you talk about the performance module that uses the learned models. And you have really not told us about that because we, and you have to talk about the representation. So, so the interaction kernel, sometimes you show a curve, sometimes you show equations. I, I don't know what they mean and I don't know how you use them to predict behavior. So without talking about learning or discovery, okay. can you just talk about the kernel and how it's used to make to generate pr predictions. Oh, yes, yes. So the kernel is, is this guy, the function that gives me the, the change into the state vector. So this, this guy, this interaction function here. Could you, could you show a, a pic, a one, you, you, one of the early slides you had, you had, you had curves and I didn't understand how the interaction kernel was a curve. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, so, so let's go back to the comparison. Uh, let me see. So, you this kernel or is that? How is that? A, yes. How is that an equation? Well, this is this because the interaction kernel depends on pairwise data, so it's actually just a one D function. Depends on it, part, so, part. So, what is this a function of? Because the font is pretty small. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh it's a, let me. Zooming. So this is a function of R, which is a parallel interaction uh, variable. So it's just a distance function. It's a function of distance. The x axis is the distance, and what's the, the y distance. axis? Y axis is like the string, like how much, how much interactions you would exalt, uh, give based on this distance. Okay, so this is a highly nonlinear function, and that's okay. Yes. And you and and you estimate the shape, or you yes. give it. Uh, I estimated this from the dynamic data, so this, yeah. And you, you, but you assume that uh, you assume that the uh, that that us, all the agents of a particular class have the same kernel, exact with the the same graph here, with the same parameters or different. Parameters? 
Well, uh, this would be at the same kernel because they are the same type. If they are the same type, they will have the same kernel. Uh, uh, if they are different types, they will have different kernels, but not depends on parameters. Depends okay, on but the not, power but distance. Not, but, but not, but not, not different shape, not different, not the same shape, but different parameters. The actual same curve here would everything of the same type would have this kernel. Yeah, yes, the same type would have this kernel. Yeah. Okay, so in the in case of of the gravitational attraction in the, in the planetary in the in the solar system, uh, I assume that the kernel does not look like this. It's actually much simpler. No. Is that true? It's, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so for the um, sorry, let me go back to the uh, uh, the in the gravity of oh, so here. So with that, the kernel will look like this. Thank you, and so. And it's no easier, but you're saying it's, and that, and that could be described parametrically with a closed form equation, but you're yes. not assuming that. No. It's a, so you, you, you could imagine a version of your approach that yes. only works with parametric equations, and then that would presumably be even, e be even more computer computationally efficient. Yes, yes. If, if I assume, if I have more prior knowledge of this, yes, we're actually looking into this so-called semi-parametric learning that we have some kind of parametric structure and that will help us sure. learn that fast. And, and yeah. I can imagine yeah. piecewise linear or, or piecewise parametric versus these two, but, yeah. but, but in general, it could be arbitrary. It and, could and, and, and you said it's a function of distance, but distance of course, isn't the only, that's, that is, assumes that you're talking about three dimensional motion. Um, yeah. This approach obviously is not gonna be limited to that. I could imagine applying it to other dynamical systems like in chemistry. Yes, where yes. Uh, where where the dimensions are very different. Uh, yes, yes. In fact, if I uh, uh, there was a two uh, D example that I show, uh, this this flocking here, uh, anticipation uh, flocking dynamics here, it, it not only depends on power distance, it also have a uh, power uh, heading. The heading okay. is also taken into account so that it will actually revolve instead of going straight. Yeah. All right. So yeah. look, I, I think this is great work. I'm really excited about it. Uh, but let me encourage you, because since okay. this is so novel, at least to me, that uh -huh. you spend more time in future talks e explaining this up front because I, okay. to me it's, it, it's alien. I, the notion of a kernel, of course, has been around in machine learning for 30 years. But yes, uh -huh. but, but the notion of an interaction kernel is that is that is that been in the literature or is that a new idea? It is a new idea we've been pushing. So Fine. yes. Then yeah. then you should spend more time on it. That's it. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I will do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Is there any other questions from audience? I guess you know the pet asked a, a lot more questions, but I guess we can go on, you know offline for those questions. Yeah, I'm sorry about jumping about these questions. I, uh, yeah. No worries. No worries. All right, I don't see any questions. Um, oh, so, so, so is there any other work on, on learning models of collective behavior? Not your approach, but other approaches to doing this. Uh, you can, so um, uh, the thing is you can actually do it using a neural network. You can think of, uh, you can just fit. So for example, like- the Oh, well, you can use it, you, you can, I, I, I'm sure you could. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is, have people actually done that? Is, is there uh, a literature on learning collective behaviors well, by yes. whatever method, by by some other method, yes. For example, they okay. actually did fit it using neural network, and then and then, uh, but they didn't do the predictions. They only talk about the regression of this function. Okay, so you can do that using neural network. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure you could use things other than neural nets. I'm not a big fan of neural nets personally. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, what the, our approach is, it, we we not only learn the interaction kernel, we also learn the feature map, which is the yeah. feature. Map. Is shared among all the dynamical system. It's just the interaction might be different. Okay. So we want to learn the feature. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds good. Well, if there's no further questions, then we can, um, you know, thank our speaker for the great talk. Uh, and um, I'm sure um, we have learned a lot. And if there if there's a further questions. Um, you guys can reach out to Ming directly and he will be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Right, Ming? Yep, yep. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And and uh, with this talk, I, I'm I hope that uh, the there will be future collaborations, um, you know, among us. Um, that would be wonderful. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ming. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will conclude the uh, the, the seminar today. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you.